I wanted to be, well, I was interviewed when I was a, a student at Oxford University and by the Sun newspaper in its earliest manifestation, before the Sun became the Rupert Murdoch tabloid, it was a large format newspaper, the successor to the Daily Herald. And they came to Oxford University to interview people of the future. I remember that I was one of them. And uh, the actress Diana Quick was another. The poet and then playwright Michael Rosen was the third. But they gave me the headline. And the headline read, I want to be a sort of Danny Kay and then Home Secretary. <laughs> I think, in truth, I probably wanted to be Laurence Olivier and then Prime Minister, but I felt it was becoming, aged 18 or 19, to say to the son, to, to lower my aspirations. They were pretty ambitious, because Danny Kay at that time was one of the world's leading entertainers, and when I was a, a little boy in the 1950s, he was considered to be the greatest performer who had ever appeared at the London Palladium. He was a song and dance man. Why I should have had any of such aspirations, I don't know, since I can neither sing nor dance, nor never could, even when I was that age. But I did want to be Home Secretary. My childhood passion, don't ask me why, but my childhood, literally childhood passion, had been prisons and prison reform. From the age of about 12, I joined organisations like the Howard League for Penal Reform. I took a real interest in the subject, and from the age of 16, I began visiting prisons. Not as a prison visitor, not doing good works, but actually touring prisons. And incredibly, I got into them. I, I, I wrote to prison governors saying, I'm a schoolboy, uh, I'm writing a project for you know, A-level uh, about prisons, may I come and visit your prison? And I travelled around prisons in this country and in France, because I was doing A-level French. They were extraordinary. They were really grim, the prisons in France. I remember going into Place Vendôme, near the Paris Ritz, aged 17, during a holiday, and seeing one of the officials there and saying, you know, I've come, I want to see a prison. And instead of kicking me out, this official listened to me and said yes. And it was arranged that the following week I should go to see the first of the French prisons I visited. And it was like going back to Charles Dickens's time, the prison that I visited. I mean, there were literally rats running in the corridors of the prison. The, the walls were running with damp. It was extraordinary. And I then, during my gap year, visited prisons throughout the United States of America. Um, there was the death penalty in many states at that time. I remember going in Maryland, in Baltimore, uh, my first time on death row, uh, and they had a gas chamber there. And I remember the prison governor saying, you want to try the pressure cooker? And I sat in this gas chamber, and they closed the door as a little joke on this boy. Um, but it was my passion. My interest was prison reform. And in fact, while I was still a student at a university, I was asked if I'd like to write a book, because I'd appeared in debates that had been televised. And I decided I wanted to write about prisons. And I made a particular study of the creative work of people in prisons, how uh, artwork and writing poetry and painting and making sculptures and practical work could, could help prisoners. I was interested in, in practical ways of prison reform. Anyway, I wrote this book called Created in Captivity. I signed the contract while I was still a student at university. So my, my passion, and at that time, the Home Secretary was the person in charge of the prison service. Now it's the Justice Secretary. But in those days, it was the Home Secretary. And I thought this, I'm going to, I'm actually going to make a difference. And curiously, don't ask me why, that was the area in which I chose to make my difference, was in the realms of prison reform when I was a teenager. When did you discover party politics? Oh, before then. I was always interested in party politics. My father was a keen liberal, and I think he was a may even have been a prospective parliamentary candidate for the Liberals at one stage. And uh, this was before the existence of the Liberal Democrats. But the Liberal Party was re led in the 1950s by a, a very nice man called Joe Grimmond. And so in the 1950s, the 1959 election, I think I, in my school, I stood as the Liberal candidate when we had a kind of mock election. Mm. But by the time we got into the 1960s, don't ask me why, I think I realised the Liberals were going nowhere that Mr. Grimmond was a nice man, but there was no possibility 
And I thought, you know, if I'm going to get I'm going to get anywhere with my prison reform. I need to be backing a party that's going to be in power in government. And I saw looking at history that the most successful political party in the history, possibly of the world, certainly of the British Isles, was the Conservative Party. And also I'd found people like a Disraeli, rather glamorous, great 19th century prime minister. And so I became a conservative. And at my school in the various elections in the 60s, 1964 and then 66, I think there were two elections that year, I was the conservative candidate at school. There were candidates for all the parties, and I sort of emerged as the conservative candidate. And so I think uh, um, Harold Macmillan was then the, the prime minister and uh, a, a great character. Uh, I love the idea of, of Harold Macmillan. I love the idea that genuinely he would, you know, uh, of an afternoon in the middle of a crisis, he'd curl up in front of the fire with a trollop. Uh, and the little pun, the little joke intended there, but we knew that it was one of the novels by uh, the great Victorian uh, political and social novelist, Anthony Trollope. So uh, I thought he was an amusing character. And then Sir Alec Douglas Hume became the leader of the Conservative Party. He had been Lord Hume, the 14th Earl of Hume. Uh, I liked Harold Wilson's joke, um, you know, well, mocking him. And then, in fact, I liked better uh, Lord Hume's reply and saying, well, yes, I'm, I may be the 14th Earl of Hume, but I assume that Mr. Wilson is the 14th Mr. Wilson. And he became... Alec Douglas Hume, and then he became Prime Minister. So I backed him. He looked like a skull. The posters for him were much mocked at school. I, I went to a boarding school called Beedales, which is now very fashionable. It was quite fashionable then. It had a kind of Christian socialist ethos. So I was a bit of an odd boy out at the school because, you know, it, the ethos was going to be Labour was going to win, and they did win. And in fact, they won nationally, and Harold Wilson became Prime Minister. And at the time that I was, you know, at university and interested in prison reform, Roy Jenkins had just become Home Secretary, and he was considered a great reforming Home Secretary. And though I was a, a Conservative, I had high hopes of Roy Jenkins. In fact, the first time I think I appeared on national television was when I was interviewed as a student uh, by Panorama. And I was very excited as a student to be interviewed by Panorama. And I talked about Roy Jenkins and prison reform. So that was the, the roots of it all. Did you make a decision to embrace the values and ideology of the Conservative Party and to reject uh, so socialism? Was that a conscious uh, intellectual process you, you went on? Yes, it must have been, um, because for two reasons. One, my, my mother, I think, was a Conservative though she wasn't politically very engaged. Uh, my father was engaged, and there he was. He was a Liberal candidate. Uh, there was uh, Hugh Gateskill was the leader of the Labour Party at this time, before Harold Wilson. And Hugh Gateskill um, uh, died comparatively young, and he died at the Middlesex Hospital. And my sister was a trainee nurse at the Middlesex Hospital, and by then she may have been a qualified nurse, and she was one of the nurses who... Uh, looked after Hugh Gateskill, and she would come home with stories of this this great man. So I had, as it were, uh, pictures from all sides. I, uh, and but the, the 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 line I was being fed was the liberal line, or indeed the old Christian socialist line. And I think I must have decided that that, for some reason, wasn't for me. I think even as a young person, I thought, well, you know, I think the idea of Oh, less government is better government, things from the bottom up rather than the top down. Those sort of simple conservative ideas. Also, I loved the pragmatism. I think I felt, certainly that was my view about the prisons. I wanted practical solutions. What was interesting to me, doing all, as this teenager, visiting all these prisons around the world, and I went to Russia when I was still a student. I went to Russia, believe this or not, I went to the Soviet Union, I got to Moscow and they let me visit prisons in Russia. I find this very hard to believe now. It's the kind of daring thing that a child would do. No grown-up would think of doing it. You wouldn't think, oh, I can get into a prison anywhere. You wouldn't dream of it. But if a child, a student, sends the letter, somehow maybe the person receiving it thinks, well, we'll help this kid. And visiting all these prisons, one of the things I discovered was that it wasn't that all the philosophies, all the philosophies seemed to have the same end product. This was what slightly depressed me was that you could go to a prison in Scandinavia, or indeed in America, that was very forward-thinking, that was very modern, where the, the cells seemed to be like a 
you'd find in a, you know, almost in a modern hotel. Uh, and there was a regime that was enlightened. And you'd go to a very primitive prison that was like a Victorian prison, like Strangeways in Manchester. But the end product, the result, the amount of recidivism was the same. So I had all these grand schemes when I was a young person. And I think my feeling was uh, the Conservatives are going to make this work better than this collectivist, socialist idea. How old were you when you joined the Conservative Party? I think probably I had joined when I was a child because when I was the candidate in the 1960s at school, I got all these wonderful posters of Sir Alec Douglas Hume, and I loved the public meetings. That was one of the exciting things about politics in the 1960s. I went to hear Harold Wilson at a public meeting. My God, he was magnificent. Ah, I can't tell you how exciting he was. I, later, when I was grown up, I, I, in fact, not when I was grown up, when I was in my 20s, I, I, I got to know him and his lovely wife, Mary, to go to a public meeting, a thousand people in the hall. And there was Harold Wilson giving an impromptu speech. And not only were there questions, any question from anywhere in the hall, but there was barracking, shouting, and he dealt with it. A thousand people, tremendous. The heckles were part of the comedy. I mean, people would shout out things and he there would be reposts. It was tremendous stuff, just magical. And it was a sense that it's real. And I don't know that in today's politics I would be very much at home because my, I mean, though I'm still alive, I think my <laughs> my political spirit is springboard is the 19th century and um, its sort of roots are in the first half of the 20th century. Tell me how you felt when they declared Giles Brownroof is elected as the new member of parliament for the city of Chester. How did that feel to you? It was the most momentous moment in the sense of my life. There's a, a line in Anthony Trollope where he describes the initials MP as being the two most distinguished initials that you can have. It's nice to have an OBE, a CBE, an MBE, a KG. Um, but an MP, that after your name, you've, it's, it's for you. People have actually chosen you. The moment I became a member of parliament, it was tremendously exciting and I had five of the most fascinating years of my life and I was a, I, I do a lot of different things and it's a besetting sin uh, I have a my laptop has the mantra on it don't dabble focus but when I was an MP I did focus for five years that's all I did it was terrifying because I hadn't really I hadn't thought about the money so my income suddenly slumped because I, I, I was an author and a broadcaster and did a lot of television and you know commercial work and I was you know I was well paid and then suddenly I was living on 30,000 32,000 whatever the salary was then for members of parliament quite sufficient to live on more than enough to live on more, much more than a lot of people do live on but I hadn't really thought about that so that the, the income fell uh, and I thought well but it doesn't matter I am doing this I am going to be a member of Parliament and do it properly. You entered Parliament as a household name. Uh, many of your colleagues would have envied that. D did did you find that created some some tension, some people to be hostile? A, a little bit. Um, I say, you say that. I mean, it was because uh, uh, I mean a lot of them don't didn't watch television. Don't watch television. They didn't quite know who I was. I was famous for wearing woolly jumpers, and there is. The, the true famous story of almost the first time I got up to speak because I, I was notorious for appearing on TV wearing colourful knitwear and um, on programmes like Countdown and I was on Seven Years TV AM, the first commercial breakfast station uh, in the, the UK. And so I was known for appearing in these funny jumpers. And when I got up to speak almost the first time in the House of Commons, sitting on the opposition front bench was John Prescott. I don't know if he was then deputy leader, but anyway, he was a front bench spokesman. And he clearly recognised me. He partly knew I was because his parents uh, lived in Chester. They were constituents of mine. And so he did know who I was, but he remembered the woolly jumpers. So he mocked me uh, from a sedentary position and began barracking me, going, woolly jumper, woolly jumper. Anyway, I struggled on with my speech, attempting to be, you know, give my... Uh, oratorical flourishes to whatever I was saying, but I was thrown by it. Anyway, on I went, 
But on he went, going, woolly jumper, woolly jumper. Well, eventually I had to pause and point out to Mr. Prescott that the joy of a woolly jumper is that you can take it off at will, whereas the blight of a woolly mind is that you're lumbered with it for life. If you you hadn't lost your seat, was it your wish to carry on sitting as a Member of Parliament for, for many years? Yes, that was my plan. I mean, I, w- I was very, very lucky. I became an MP. I found it fascinating. Uh, I, I was interested to find that government was the thing. And in my day, it was much easier for the senior politicians to mingle, for the ministers to mingle with the troops, because we had all-night sittings when I began. And Parliament was in the afternoon and in the evenings. And so members of Parliament were there all afternoon, all evening, occasionally, all night. And the government was there all the time. The Prime Minister, on a regular basis, was in the members' dining room of an evening having dinner. So that you had access to these people, the most senior people. And it was voting in person. This year, one of the frustrations for them has been this voting. I don't know how they're voting now, whether they're voting in person or online or however long it takes. But the point is, in the good old days, you, when you were voting, there were several hundred people in a lobby for 20 minutes. If you wanted to raise something with the Prime Minister, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, the Home Secretary, you didn't need to make an appointment. You knew the guy or the girl. You went up to them and you said... In fact, you said Prime Minister in those days, you used to call them Prime Minister or Chancellor. You would say, Prime Minister, oh, can I have a quick word? And then you would say what your problem was. And he would then make a note of it. In the case of John Major, he actually took out a pencil, wrote it down. Or in his case, he usually had his uh, PPS, a lovely man called Graham Bright, trotting along beside him. He would make a note of it. And you could communicate instantly. And the constituency was important, it was necessary, but it became, to be honest, a bit of a, a bit of a grind. Hearing people's problems is always interesting, and you hope you can make a difference. But uh, unveiling plaques, visiting places, that can get a bit wearisome. Also, I did tell you what got me down. Everybody I met, I only met two types of people, actually. People with problems and people who were right. Everybody thinks they know the answer. And the truth is, Nobody really knows the answer. We're all meaning well. We're trying well. It's like this year people have been asking for clarity. Well, what clarity is possible? This is an uncertain world. Nobody knows what the future holds. Oh, we, we, we need a roadmap. We need to know what the exit is. Well, of course, we as politicians need to understand that's what people want. And so we need to give them uh, some sort of roadmap. We need to feel that there is an exit. We need particularly to offer them hope. There has to be light at the end of the tunnel. There has to be the shining castle on top of a hill. But the truth is, nobody knows what the future holds. The Conservative Party, it's a a broad church of opinion. Would you feel comfortable with any of the labels, Thatcherite, Majorite, Cameroonite, Johnsonite? No. Uh, I I mean, I've always been an instinctive loyalist and, um, you know, Uh, trained as a a government whip, I I tow the line. But I like doing that because I think the government of the day has been elected. Uh, It's got a programme. You want it to deliver. If you've got problems, then you raise them um, directly and at the highest level that you can. Uh, So I don't, I'm not... Well, I mean, you can if 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 anybody knows me, they know I'm a well-meaning middle of the road bloke. Uh, but at the same time, all the people, all the people whose names you have mentioned, are people that I have been lucky enough. What a privilege to have known people like Margaret Thatcher. What an extraordinary phenomenon she was, Margaret Thatcher. To have known her, and I knew her towards the end of her life reasonably well. My wife and I. She was extraordinary. No sense of humour. That was the only downside. Couldn't really tell her a joke. She didn't really have much of a sense of humour. I always thought that must have made bringing up Mark quite challenging. Anyway, that's by the by. But knowing her, knowing John Major, knowing all all the leaders, knowing uh, Boris Johnson, fascinating. Interesting thing about Boris, Oscar Wilde had a belief that for people to live in the public imagination, they had to have a name of five letters. Uh, Like Oscar, or indeed Wilde, like Giles. Or indeed, as he said, Jesus, uh, or Plato, or Jumbo. He said this when he went to see Jumbo the Elephant at the Barnum and Bailey Circus in New York. 
Uh, and you think about that in relation to Boris. And uh, people who are known by one name, five letters, they live in the public imagination. And, and Oscar Wilde said, if they like you, they use your first name, as in Boris. And if they don't like you so much, they use your surname, five letters, as in Trump. Let's talk about Brexit briefly. Where was middle of the road for you when it came to the oh, referendum? I mean, I was very much a, a, a pro e, uh, pro common market person in 1960, whatever it was, no, 73, was it 73, 75, when there was the referendum. I ran something called People for Europe. Uh, I was the sort of director of People for Europe. It was part of the uh, European movement get us to confirm saying yes to the common market when Ted Heath was the Prime Minister and I, I was lucky enough to know uh, Ted Heath. Oh. And um, so I was uh, absolutely you know, keen on the common market. As the years went by and the European Union developed, its trajectory probably was not for me. So I became, as the years went by, more sceptical, as many people became more sceptical. But whenever the referendum was, was it in my lifetime? We're still talking about Brexit. Can't, I know it's Times Radio, and you've got to touch on it, but still. Uh, whenever the referendum was, three, four years ago, I, of course, voted yes to stay. Uh, but when the decision was made, I accepted that totally, instantly. It wasn't a problem for me. That's what the people have decided. It will create problems. Of course it will. Um, but change is actually quite exciting. Change is quite good. I'm, I, I do believe that I'm a conservative with a, you know, on the whole, I'm a conservative with a small c. I don't like change. I know change is good for us. When the result of the general election came, it was certainly clear that Brexit was happening, and so be it. And so it will happen, and it has happened, and um, on on we go. Um, but I, I tell you. The good thing about being out of politics now, and I know we're here to talk about politics, but the great thing about being out of politics now is that it doesn't worry me. I haven't been worried. It doesn't, you know, people have been, oh, getting exercised about Trump. I mean, well, yeah, of course. I mean, some of it would seem to be totally crazy, but at least there weren't any big international wars. And I thought it was rather amazing that here we had, you know, Donald Duck and Woody Woodpecker's love child as president of the United States. Amazing. I didn't get het up about it. I don't think I get het up about things very much. I remember, I think it's Arthur Balfour, a forgotten prime minister, who said, nothing matters very much, and most things don't matter at all. And my view is, it'll all work out in the end. Charles Brownruth, we've come to the end of our conversation and the part of the interview where we try to categorise the people that we've spoken to based on the conversation that we have had. Um, I'm going to say you're an instinctive Conservative Party loyalist. Yes. Why not? You say whatever you do. Know you say what you like. But what I, would you? It's but not you, bothering me. I don't mind what you say. I what think it's do you very buy? Sweet that you should call me at all. Uh, uh, would you... I have to tell you yes, I tell you one of the reasons I am is I have a I am anyway but uh, and I think it's a good thing to be uh, there's, no, there's no harm to be honest as a rule there's no harm in loyalty um, you know and I, I have lots of friends who are um, in loyal Labour Party people loyal uh, Liberal Party people Lib Dems as they call them now and I have a daughter who is a Conservative councillor in South West London and she God she is brilliant uh, they're lucky to have her and she stood at the general election. And I went out to support her, um, as it were, just locally. I don't do any national politics now because I feel I'm I'm a reporter. I appear on, you know, the one show for the BBC. I don't think I need to parade my politics. And I don't parade my politics. I make a, a point of not. I keep myself below. But she was standing. So I, I went to support her and I knocked on people's doors. I knocked on her door and I gave the man my leaflet. And I said, I hope you'll vote for my daughter in the forthcoming general election. It was She was in a no-hope Lib Dem seat, the seat, in fact, of the present leader of the uh, Lib Dems. And um, I said, I hope you'll vote for my daughter. And he said rather aggressively, what's she got to offer then? I said, what's she got to offer? Um, integrity and intelligence. And he leaned towards me and said, are you sure she's your daughter? Thank you. It's been a pleasure to 
talk to you and to listen to you. Giles Brundra, thank you very much for your time. Well, thank you very much. For, forgive me for just burbling on, <laughs> no. but I thought I'm not going to be able to answer any of your questions, so I'll just talk <laughs> away and uh, say what little I've got to say. And there we are.